Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you everyone for joining us today in our daily talk. Today we are honored and thrilled to have Omar Yaqub from IFSA join us to talk a little bit uh, to us about um, IFSA's work um, in our city Edmonton and in uh, Alberta and what kind of things they've been facing during this um, COVID-19. Brother Omar for joining us. Well, assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. Brother Omar, um, I will kick this off by asking you to just tell us a little bit about yourself and about IFSA and what kind of work does IFSA do in general? Yeah, no, thank you uh, very much for having me. So a little bit about me. I've been, uh, been working in the nonprofit sector for the better part of two decades. Um, you know, I did my MBA at the U of A, born and raised in Edmonton. And I've also been doing management consulting and teaching. Uh, I've been teaching corporate sustainability in the MBA program at the U of A uh, for a decade. A little bit about IFSA, which is like, I think the, the thing I'm really passionate about. I've been uh, serving with the organization for, uh, served with the organization on the board for a decade and then left and then came back in a staff role. I'm really excited to be doing that. A lot of people don't know about IFSA. It's this hidden gem in the Edmonton Muslim community. It's been around for nearly 30 years. And IFSA is a Islamic Family and Social Services Association. Islamicfamily.ca is the quick and easy way to find us. And it's here to provide those essential services that the community needs. And that's everything from uh, safety, security, and growth. And so you know, I, I like to think about that spectrum of services is everything from someone who's hungry to someone who is uh, facing anxiety to uh, the, the person who wants to help bring a relative over because they're a refugee or the youth who's looking to connect and grow in their connection to their Muslim identity. And so we run a host of programs. We have over 20 staff and three locations in Edmonton. Okay, and IFSA is only located in Edmonton, right? Correct. Uh, okay. We serve people from as far south as Red Deer, like people from Red Deer will drive up to access IFSA, people as far north as Fort Mac. And uh, last year we launched a helpline and now people are calling us from all over the province and even outside of the province to access the helpline. So tell us a little bit about the helpline. What kind of services can I get if I call the helpline? What happens when I call the helpline? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the helpline is a general purpose helpline. Um, it's the gateway to accessing a lot of IFSA services. So people might call because they're, they're facing anxiety and they want to make an appointment with uh, a trained psychologist and they want a psychologist who understands their, uh, their faith. And so we have registered psychologists on staff that they can access and we can also bridge them to other psychologists that are in the Edmonton area. People might call because they're having um, challenges with rent and they're looking for someone who can help advocate for them because they're facing an eviction or they're, um, they're in the midst of a very difficult time in their marriage or in their home and they're, uh, they're looking for help navigating that. Right? One of the things IFS has been doing for more than a decade is helping people through the challenge of domestic violence. And we look at that holistically. We're one of only four organizations in Edmonton that provides court mandated support for perpetrators of violence. So whether someone's a perpetrator or a victim of domestic violence, IFSA has ways that it can help. And then, you know, youth having questions about identity, wanting to connect with online programming. So it's a, it's a whole range of services. That sounds really good, uh, Brother Amar. You mentioned a lot of services that I think um, are, are, are part of a, a larger partnership when you really think about it. Like when you were mentioning domestic violence, my first thought was Nisa Home. 
as a transitional mm-hmm. shelter for a lot of the victims, especially who are women. And you were talking about youth. Um, the first thing that came to my mind is a couple of the local mosques and um, other youth programs that we have. Um, when you talk about immigration, many unite in Catholic social services. So how does this work as a dynamic in our city? How does this partnership um, work within your organization? Yeah, great question. So it says uh, one of our, our core values is partnership. We work with a number of organizations. We work with the MCN Catholic Social Services. You know, together with those two organizations, we were able to help bring in 400 refugees uh, during the uh, 2015 uh, refugee crisis. Um, so we're really closely integrated with those organizations. We work with a number of organizations around domestic violence, including the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters and others. And so we're, we're providing that layer of cultural and spiritual competency to help people bridge access to those services. Uh, NISA has been doing some work around uh, domestic violence, specifically around shelters, and they have uh, you know, a, a few units to help people, specifically with that two months of transitional housing. If says services are um, start from you know when that person identifies a challenge in their home, needing help navigating that challenge, um, trying to rectify that challenge before it potentially gets out of hand, right? So you know counseling, uh, court mandated supports, what have you. Should it um, should it escalate? You know developing the safety plans for people, uh, helping them find the shelter option that's the best for them, getting them into a hotel if they need that, um, helping them navigate the courts if they need that, and um, you know, going, going with a person throughout their entire journey until they're strong, independent, and able to flourish. Why was there a need to have a Muslim organization that offers these services? You know, I think as Muslims, you know, our, our faith is often the at the forefront of our identity and how we look at problems and our worldview. And so it's really important that, um, that we bring that perspective to the table when helping people navigate challenges. We also know that a lot of Muslims aren't adequately served by the existing supports that are there. Right? The, um, you know, the organizations may not be set up to speak to their values. Right? If they're a newcomer and they see Mennonite or they see Catholic, they might just stop and say, oh, this is a proselytizing organization, even though they're not. And that alone is a reason for us to say, okay, let's, let's provide a bridge to help people access it. I think also there's a really important reason, which is our faith has something to contribute to this society. Right? So when we're looking at how do we help people navigate challenges, uh, you know, our faith has something to teach us and it has something to... Um, has a perspective that can benefit the entire sector. I, I look at something like, you know, the um, child intervention services, right? Like when a child is taken out of a home, right? There's there's a lot of a lot of difficulty in that. But our faith talks about, oh, you know, there's a desire to preserve lineage. There's a desire, um, a mandate to, um, you know, reunify families, and that's something that's kind of hardwired into our faith. And so bring that perspective to something, right? When we think about newcomers or uh, people looking to start something, right? Ways of helping them access capital that don't make them incur interest. Those are really essential, right? And when we think about um, mental health services, right? Looking at the whole person, including their faith is essential to driving to a good solution. Now, you you touched on mental health services, and I think this is such an important part, and we've been talking um, about it a lot recently into kind of removing the stigma around mental health and around um, anxiety and depression, and that uh, many scholars and many imams have been talking about it as um, you're not a bad Muslim if you suffer from anxiety. It's really, it's it's something that um, has like a stigma around it in our community. Why was it important for IFSA to have that mental health line, to have counselors on staff that are available to talk? And how did having that um, service remove or improve or change the stigma around mental health? You know, I think um, 
I think accessing mental health is it's a bit different than accessing conventional medicine, right? Um, you know, when you, but but not entirely, right? There's, um, you know, when you see a doctor, you might connect with one doctor more than another. It's like that doctor spent a little bit more time, that doctor asked me a few more questions about um, what I'm doing outside of like this one um, one problem, right? Or when we're, you know, trying to find someone we want to work with, right? There's always this great emphasis on fit right? And like two people connecting, right? So you might really, really appreciate what one shake has to say. And another shake might be saying the same thing, but it just doesn't get to your heart, right? And I think uh, mental health is really similar, right? It's really important that there are people there that can appreciate the fullness of the person and help them access services. And, you know, working also, as you said, right, to reduce that taboo, right? If someone has a broken foot, we them to pray but we also tell them like you know go and get medical help right and so seeing both of those as essential right that um you know anxiety isn't something that someone should be ashamed of especially in the circumstance we're in now where um you know you can't watch the news for more than a few minutes without feeling tense and nervous and worried about what might be happening maybe not to you but to your friends and to people around you and then you might be in a situation at home where you know, there isn't uh, a moment of silence. And so all those things can contribute to anxiety. And, you know, if you were in a job that demanded more of you physically, you'd start to say, oh, okay, I need to do some, uh, some special exercises in order to be able to do this job, right? Likewise, we have to treat our, our mental health and our spiritual health in those same ways, right? Like we have to prepare ourselves to deal with this situation and give ourselves more, uh, you know, more supplements, more, uh, more uh, tools to be able to deal with anxiety and other mental health challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Um, SubhanAllah, in, in our communities, um, you do find a lot when you um, tell somebody to actually call the mental health line, the first answer is, I'm not mental, there's nothing wrong with me. But you're like, no, 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 nobody just called you mental. But um, it, I do find it to be very important. And I do really appreciate the fact that if they have these services available for our Muslim community, because as you said, it's important to have somebody to talk to that does understand the faith background that you're coming from to so they can connect with you on this uh, on that level. Now, um, let me ask you something, Brother Amr. Are these services free? Yes, uh, if the services are free, right? We, uh, we're supported by community. And so uh, we realize that sometimes accessing a counselor might be prohibitively expensive for people. And so you know, that's the reason we're here is to make it accessible. Okay. And um, one question that is very, very important right now um, with accessibility and um, having your services, we're going into a crisis, right? We're all going through this together. And I'm sure this has affected your operations. It has affected your services, but we'll get that to that in a minute. How did it affect your operation, your services? My dark question to you is how did that affect your funding? And um, looking at all of the, the funds that their government providing is IFSA um, able to take advantage of this funding? You mentioned that you're funded by community. Is that, is it, are you fully funded by community or is the government um, supporting you guys as well. If not, with the changes, is are we looking at government support for IFSA's operation? Yeah, that's a, a, another great question. So about 60% of IFSA's funding comes from government, and alhamdulillah, that's, uh, that's secure. 40% of our funding, uh, about $600,000, comes from community. We had to cancel our two, uh, our two community dinners, which is where the majority of our uh, community funding comes from, right? And so, you know, the uh, the outlook is murky, right? You know, inshallah, Allah provides, and we're praying. But uh, you know, it's it's also important for community members who who have the means right now to contribute if they can, right? Our food depot, uh, our food hamper, which is the second largest in the city, is uh, is funded primarily by community, right? And without community support, we won't have the money to um, help feed people. Right. We also collect and distribute zakat, um, both zakat al fitr and zakat al mal, right? And so normally zakat al fitr, which is you know that ten eleven dollars that people pay prior to Eid, right? We ask mosques like the Rashid to you know, pledge a certain amount. We 
pre-order that amount months in advance. And then we distribute that amount in Ramadan to comply with, um, you know, the, the faith guidelines of distributing and collecting that amount in a short amount of time, right? So we've incurred this large cost to be able to get people Ramadan hampers and we're totally unsure of where the funding will come because people aren't going to the mosque so they won't be able to contribute. And then with Zakat al-Mal, right, it's really important that, um, you know, people uh, continue to support local um, if they can, right? And then also with Sadaqan, with general donations, that's really, really important because that supports some of the staffing and some of the intangible costs that allow the work to continue. Now, with Ramadan coming up, how is that affecting? Um, I know Ramadan is a big month for a lot of Muslim communities, especially with fundraising. Um, do you guys have an alternative plan of what you might be expecting to happen? You know, we're we're hoping to reach out with people through channels like this one, right? Uh, through shared messaging on newsletters. We know everybody's looking for funds, but you know, there are certain funds that are designated for uh, the poor in our community. So if people can distribute, there's a cup locally and there's a cup of fitter locally, that makes a big difference. I know oftentimes people are uh, trying to send that money overseas. And uh, you know, I just want to emphasize to people that there is a need here and there's opportunities to contribute here. Um, can you yeah, talk I think a little was... bit to us about the need, Brother Omar? Because I think um, there's a lot of misinformation about what kind of need our Muslim community does have here. So can you talk a little bit as, to us about numbers, maybe, of um, the yeah. food services that you provide, the immigration services, the youth service? Like, what is the need like here? Yeah, so um, every month, you know, there are three to 5,000 individuals that need, that use IFSA's food hampers, right? Um, back in January, what we did was we spent a lot of time reassessing each and every one of our clients. We were able to take our numbers down right from uh, 5,000 to 3,000. Now that number is going to go back up, right? So, you know, alhamdulillah, we spent the time back in January to kind of reassess people. But um, but so with the 5,000 people that actually receive food hampers. Correct. That's just food hampers, right? That doesn't oh, wow. include the number of hours of counseling, the number of hours of outreach work, uh, the number of unique individuals that access um, youth programming, right? And so we have the kind of the first paid Muslim chaplain uh, at two different campuses in Edmonton, right? And that's a service that's now online there for youth to, to access. And so, you know, all of those things require community support to, uh, to be maintained. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 5,000 food hampers, just that needs a lot of support, absolutely. Um, now, uh, Brother Omar, let's go back to the operation and what has been going on on the ground with IFSA in light of COVID-19. I mean, in a Rashid mosque, things have shifted and changed in an incredible way, and you probably know that. But how about yeah. IFSA? Like the access for the youth programs, immigration for, um, like even with the food hampers, being able to organize that and arrange it. How did it, how is it looking different and what kind of measurements did IFSA have to go into to ensure that you are in line with everything that we're being told that we need to follow. Yeah, I was on a call with Brother Khaled yesterday and Marshall, I really, really appreciate him. He was really pragmatic. He was like, no, we're not doing this, right? It's not safe. And like, you know, other people were pushing back. He's like, no, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, I think it's important that we realize we're all in this together, that we have to be really cautious that it's not about individuals, it's about our collective health. And this so takes it really seriously. You know, one of our staff members, uh, Samara, has been incredible, right, in terms of like reorienting our office, restructuring things, minimizing the amount of physical contact that's there, right? Some of the things we've had to do is uh, a lot of our operations are, are really dependent on volunteers, but a lot of our volunteers are seniors, right? And so it's like kind of a double whammy. So we had to say, okay, we're, we're going to ask our volunteers to stay home because we care about their health. And we don't want to put them in jeopardy. Even if they're willing to come out, we want to be cautious stewards. And so, you know, we've reduced the amount of hours and we um, are relying more on staff to do uh, a fewer amount of staff to do more work, especially around the food bank. Uh, we put plastic barriers in place. We've instituted a bunch of handling routines and uh, a ton of things to make sure that we're compliant. Uh, 
um, you know, we've rejigged our intake. Normally our intake was, you know, a one-on-one -on -one between uh, a social worker and uh, a person looking for help. And there'd be a lot of files. There'd be a lot of moving back and forth. And now we're like, okay, how can we do this digitally? How can we do it with uh, you sending pictures instead of like um, being in a small office? And so those things uh, have allowed us to be a um, you know, reduce the amount of risk that our staff members and our volunteers face. How about in your food bank with, um, because there's still a lot of interaction and we're talking about 5,000 food hampers here. So we're talking about a big amount of people and I'm sure they're not there all the same time, but we're still talking about a big amount of um, people and you got sanitization into the equation and all yeah. the rest of it. So how does um, that change especially with yeah. the lack of disinfecting wipes in the market yeah no you know um hamburger. so it's 5,000 individuals not 5,000 hampers um what we did was we we put in a like the plastic barrier we have um we have some people who made wipes uh some people who made disinfectants we have a relationship with cisco uh and so we can buy from a, a larger whole scale distributor we have community members who also contributed uh, one of the things we've been doing is also just communicating more proactively with our clients to try and spread the appointments throughout the day, have people wait in their cars um, rather than a waiting room, uh, come up to the door. So all of those little steps to kind of minimize. But, you know, it's also really, really challenging in our community because, you know, people might want to carpool, right, because they don't have a car themselves. And so they bring their friend and now you have a car with like 15 people uh, or a van with two or three families and it's like you know there's there's still a lot of uh, a lot of work to be done but we're trying our best every time we have a an opportunity to communicate with someone because they might not um they might not be uh accessing the information the way others are it's like oh hey did you know that you can be fined for what you did in the car right and so here's what you should do to minimize it we're also you know for a certain clients who are highly vulnerable we're doing delivery for them so that um, they can have packages um, at their door, right? So seniors, um, single moms, people who are highly vulnerable, uh, whatever we can do to kind of minimize that contact. And uh, we've been working with, you know, IRC and the Rashid to take some of the hampers they had there and make sure that they get to people who need them most. How did your partnerships um, improve change within this um um, epidemic. With you know, the I think I didn't want not. You know what I mean. You know, alhamdulillah, it's been really wonderful working with uh, with Masajid. You know, working with Sister Salwa at the Rashid is uh, amazing. She is such a huge resource for the community, and you know, she's one of these these hidden gems, right? And it's always wonderful when she's doing referral, she's advocating for people, she's supporting. You know, right now, I think we're really in this together, right? We know the Masajid have, they're facing the same dilemma we're facing, right? Uh, around funding, around maintaining what they're doing, maintaining staffing, right? I sent a, a message to a bunch of my Imam friends. And, you know, right after I sent the message, one of them said, hey, I've been laid off. Uh, can you help me, right? I felt really, really bad. But, you know, it's, it's one of those areas where it's like, okay, hey, let's, let's help this Imam in our community. We can understand why the Masajid he was working with could no longer support him. But let's see if we can, um, you know, respond to his question, follow up with him, see how he's doing, right? With Masajid, I think it's also really important to um, be giving them a resource that they can refer people to. So, you know, if they don't have people on staff, but they still have people coming to them looking for, for advice, having the helpline that they can refer people to saying, okay, if you're facing challenges at home, you are unsure of how to navigate and access benefits, um, you have these other concerns, uh, the massage doesn't have to be the expert on that. They can refer people to IFSA. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think especially here at the Rashid Mosque, um, it, having IFSA as a resource is a very big and important thing for us, right? Because as you said, especially when um, you're dealing with immigrants, they do look for their communities to kind of support them through their transition. Um, now, Brother Amar, what's in the future for IFSA? 
So are we looking to, um, are you guys looking to branch out outside of Edmonton? Are you pro uh, looking to provide more different services? Can you tell us a little bit what should, be, should we expect from Ifsa, inshallah, in the next couple of years? Yeah, I think, uh, I think COVID clouds the, the picture a little bit. You know, some of the things we were really hoping to do is, uh, you know, work on affordable housing because that's a huge, huge need in our community, specifically affordable housing around larger and extended families and people fleeing domestic violence. So we have a shovel ready project that we'd love to see uh, built soon, right? Um, you know, that was something that we were hoping would break ground this year, but because of all the uncertainty that that may be unlikely, you know. We want to uh, continue to grow and serve people in ways that meet them in more places and in more ways. Uh, so some of the ways we've been working at doing that is collective kitchens so that people can come regardless of socioeconomic, uh, regardless of income, come and cook together and share meals together and by sharing meals also support each other in really healthy ways, right? Um, you know, expanding the, the mental health supports we're offering because we know that um, the need is greater than what we presently have. We're looking at areas around, um, around protecting the most vulnerable in our community, like children, uh, protecting some of the most neglected in our community, like inmates, right? How do we support Muslims who have uh, fallen into uh, dark places, right? How do we help them out of that? And, you know, there, there's a ton of other areas, but those are those are some of the, the top priorities for us going into this coming year. Inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah this um, pandemic moves um, moves us in the right direction. It passes and inshallah you'll be able um, with your team and all of the support inshallah from the community to move forward because affordable housing and um, like a kitchen project, like these are all amazing projects, right? So inshallah ta'ala will be able to see them come to life. Now, Brother Amar, what would you like our community to know or what is your message to our community? How can we support you? I know you talked about um, funding and donations, but what else do you want our community to know and how can we support you? No, I think it's, it's very natural for, for us as individuals or for organizations to start to to think about our needs and our challenges and uh, you know in this time when i think everybody is is facing challenges you know it might be anxiety might be uncertainty um might be difficulty in the home uh, the the message i want them to know most is that ifs is here to help right and to spread that message to their friends to their family to people that they might know because we don't know what someone might be secretly facing and so just sharing information that yeah there's supports right um even if you're just isolated and you want to access programming for your um you know ifsa has a whole range of services online that people can access so knowing that if says their support is the biggest thing for people um spreading that message and then if people want to help they want to contribute you know may Allah increase them that help is needed now more than ever and if they're able to um it'd be greatly greatly appreciated inshallah ta'ala and we hope this message reaches inshallah everybody here in edmonton we would like to thank you very much for your time today and for all of the great work that you've been doing with efsa we really appreciate it um do you have any last words before i let you go oh, alhamdulillah jazakallah may allah uh, bless our community bless our masajid make them strong make them vital allow them to be uh, full once again and radiate light into the community and beyond, inshallah. Inshallah, and, uh, keep, brother. Allahumma amin. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, brother. Thank you so much for joining us today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.